Testing, testing. Yeah, it worked.
test. Hey, you can hear me. Working here. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our rescheduled nature competition. And it's snowing again, they tell me. So, but we're going to go through anyway. Um, to, so tonight, uh, first, let me turn down the lights, and we'll go through our announcements. Okay. Uh, next week, next Friday. We have, again, Joe Edelman. We got him on, and let me say this right this time. We paid for two and got three lectures, too. So we got a deal. And we did that because Joe is a really phenomenal speaker. He's like a motivational speaker. He really knows his photography. Um, and again, he's going to be talking about the art of seeing, why sometimes some people are just excellent at just just seeing that image that you didn't when you were in the same place and how we could get better at that. Um, and it should be a really great Zoom meeting. The clubhouse will be open. And afterwards, I'll be putting that on our uh, members-only content of the website. And uh, also, we'll be sending out a link uh, to watch from home. Yeah, question. Is he live doing it? I mean, yes. Yes, there is. A, he is. Uh, all of these Zoom ones are live. So from where they are, they are doing this live. So if there are que they always take questions too, either during or afterwards too. So yes, these are all, all live. So that is next Friday, March 29th. And then the following week from Australia, I got Greg McMillan who runs an iPhone photography school is gonna be talking to us about, uh, I wanted to get a, a lecture to the club on intro to phone photography as we start to get more involved with this. So Greg is going to be uh, doing a Zoom presentation. Again, Clubhouse will be open. We'll send out a link. Uh, that's on April 5th and should be very interesting. April 12th, a live presentation in the Clubhouse, our own Barb Pennington. Um, who is a published author several times now. Barb had recently written Not So Ordinary Women, about 50 women over 50 in the Northeast Ohio area who were outstanding. Um, and that book was published. And she has published recently a Not So Ordinary Men of 50 men from the Northeast Ohio region. And she is gonna be here in the clubhouse actually uh, talking about that. So please come and join us that night. Barb will be here. And that'll also be uh, broadcast out on our YouTube channel. Then April 19th, the boring stuff. That's right. This is, I looked over the, the, the tape of last year's uh, meeting and it, it, it almost put me to sleep. I shouldn't say that. That's a, no, it, it's a, it were required by the bylaws. This is our annual meeting and it's our election of officers. And at that time, uh, we will elect the slate of officers. You've all gotten note, all members should have gotten an email with the slates and things that are on the ballot. We'll have the election of officers for next year. Membership, I will brief them on the current direction and state of the club. The direction is north by northwest this year. And we will have a good time to direct questions and suggestions to the club leadership. So that is on April 19th uh, as well. Our next SIG meeting coming up should be interesting with Dave Bush, first uh, Thursday of every month. It'll be on infrared photography and he's gonna be talking everything about filters, uh, post-processing apps, how to modify your camera so it shoots uh, exclusively infrared. And then we'll break up as usual into our individual camera groups to discuss individual camera uh, problems. So that's on April 4th, Thursday night. Uh, our field trip season is starting up. Uh, first one coming up, April 5th, is the piston-powered Autorama, which is a lot of old cars, new cars, muscle cars, you name it. They are out at the IX Center. I went to it last time we had it. It's nice because we are getting in before the public. So it's like, and we're able to stay as long as we want. But we can get in before the public and bring tripods, anything you really want uh, as well. 
uh, when there aren't a lot of people there. So there's all information on our website about how to sign up uh, for that. That's April 5th. Volunteers, we still need co-chairs for the competition committee. Um, phone photography instructors, if you know something about phone photography and are willing to help us start a phone photography course, I could use one or two more people. Um, if you're interested, respond to the information tab uh, on our website under the volunteer section um, of that. So just go to that and let us know if you're interested. Our mentor and mentee night is coming up April 2nd. Uh, that's when you get a chance to meet the mem mentors. They will be here. You'll be able to, to see a body of their work, hear about them, hear what their schedule's like, um, and choose the right mentor for your interest. Uh, usually the sign up is after that night, and it's on our website. And on our website, we will be, we'll be also, uh, I keep wanting to say televised, it shows my, we will be putting this onto our YouTube channel so you could watch it if you can't be here that night uh, as well. And uh, the um, summary of their body of work and whatnot too, um, we'll have that as a PDF form. We'll put that up on the website as well under the mentor section. Eric's shaking his head no, but that's, if we do it differently now, Eric? In the old days, I made a real boring PDF and put it up there to put you to sleep. Eric and his team now are working, I am told, on a, on a nice new, better looking thing. So check the website under programs in the mentoring section and uh, Eric should have... No, not, not, no, no, it, it'll, after, G give him time. Okay, and again, well, yeah, I checked to see how many entries. We're getting entries coming in, but, but I need more. Um, phone competition, get those phones out. Like I said, get off the phone. That's not what it's for. Start taking some pictures um, as well. Phone competition, um, enter through shutter score like you would a regular competition. It's not part of our official competition season, but we're gonna have judging that night. We'll have, you know, really insulting comments. The usual stuff, we'll have the whole run of the gamut, but submit your iPhone pictures there. Or no, I, it's smartphone pictures. It's not, I, do I have iPhone on that? No, phone competition, any phone, not just iPhone. And as usual, this and all our Friday meetings are on our YouTube channel. And after two years, I expanded on this because this is too many directions. Go to our website. That's the YouTube icon right up there. So just click on that. And then when you get to the YouTube page, this is a YouTube page, it's counterintuitive, but click on live. Because these are in our, this is from years ago. When you click on live, that takes you to the page where all of our Friday night meetings are there in date order. So you could scroll down and find what you need. So that is our uh, talk for tonight. And we are lucky enough now, let me get up our slide to have as the judges are doing their work and judging now. Let me see. <laughs> there we go. We're lucky enough to have our own Eric Wellington from Dodd Camera tonight, who is going to uh, talk with us and has brought a lot of demo things. So, Eric, I, I turn it over to you. Hey, there we go. Hey. hey. <laughs> All right, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> uh, my name is Eric Wellington, and I'm a photographer. We all know that one. Um, I, I've been a CPS member for about 12 years and I've been on the board uh, for four-ish now. Head of the people competition, so if you come during people competition night, usually I'm up here doing, helping out with the judges and stuff like that. Um, I just recently celebrated back in December my 30th anniversary at Dodd, so I've seen it through the heyday of film, through the birth of digital, and now it seems film's making a comeback. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, for those of you that don't know, there are five Dodd camera stores, two in Northeast Ohio. The Cleveland store, which is where I'm at, and the uh, Solon store, which is a smaller store um, on the uh, east side. Uh, we also have one in Dayton, which recently moved from 
Austin Landing to Springfield, one suburb to another suburb. I have to double check that. Um, Cincinnati, which is a big store like Cleveland, and then Chicago, if you're up in the Chicago area. Um, feel free to come in and look, and like I usually tell people, come in and smell the candy. Uh, any questions about Dodd or me? No? Okay. Um, I do have my Dodd business card up here, so feel free to come grab one. My own website type stuff. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'll give you my handle. And a, um, one of the things that Dodds does is rent camera gear, and a lot of this is I pulled from the rental department. Um, but I am also giving away $25 rental vouchers. Um, most lenses rent from 25 to 50 bucks, so it could be a free lens rental or a very nominal five, 10 bucks. Uh, most bodies rent from 75 to 200, depending upon the value of the body. And recently, or up until recently, there was a deposit for the value of the equipment you're gonna rent out. So let's say if you're gonna rent out um, you know, a $2,000 body and a $1,000 lens, that's $3,000. It'd be a $3,000 temporary hold on your, on your credit card. Um, that's cut in half. So it deposits 50% of the value. Okay. So now kind of opens up the opportunity for those people that may be thinking, hey, I, maybe I don't have that kind of limit on, on my card. Um, so what I brought today, this is actually part one of part two. Uh, I did part two about three, four weeks ago with all the accessories, so I'm kind of doing it backwards. This is the bodies, lenses, and uh, flashes, oh my. Um, and depending upon how quickly I go through it, um, you'll be able to come up and, and handle the stuff, ask questions while the judges are finishing up. Um, with the accessories, I could easily hand them through or watch them go through because they were little things, but these guys are a little bit bigger, so I, I won't be doing that. Uh, so I'm just going to go from this side to that side. I brought one body from about every manufacturer I could think of, uh, including one or two that I did not expect to have, like these. Uh, so I brought the uh, A7R Mark V, which is one of their, not their flagship. The flagship is the A1, but one step below their flagship. Um, some of these I was not able to refresh my memory on a few of these things so I, I'm sorry if I screw up a little bit uh, but the A7R series in general versus the A7S or the A7s is more for resolution so this is more for still photographers um, I want to say it's a 50 meg, but I could be wrong on that. Maybe 52, 54, but I think it's a 50 meg. Okay. What I put on it is a Tamron 35 to 150, 2.0 to 2.8. So an extremely fast lens that would cover more than your typical 24 to 70 to 8, or even your 24, 105 F4s. Okay. Uh, this from what I'm hearing from customers and reviews, is one of the sharpest lenses Tamron has ever made. I might say one of the early 90 millimeter macros was probably the best one, but this guy's really close. And the fact that it does 2.0 from like 35 to maybe that 50 millimeter range, it can hold that 2.0. Once you get kind of that 50, then it kind of slides to 2.4 to 2.8 for the rest of the range. Um, See, it's kind of a little big but because of the fact of the speed of the lens. Um, very well balanced on an A7R body. Maybe slightly fried and heavy, but considering that I typically hold my camera like this, very well, uh, very well balanced. For those people that like Sigma, this is their 105 millimeter 1.4. So if you like that really soft bokeh for your portraits, you know, the 2.8's got nothing on this. Granite, she's a nice little fat guy. And if you like to put polarizers or protection filters, they're not gonna be cheap. <laughs> um, this is like, I think, a 105 millimeter filter. It's at least a 95. Yeah, 105. 
the filter size is the same as the focal length of the lens. But if you decide on any of these lenses, maybe you're a filter person, maybe you're not a filter person. If you are not a filter person, have your lens hood on because that becomes your bump protection. I'd rather you crack this hood or crack the filter than crack the lens. Um, probably would be front heavy on a body, but again, tripod collar helps you balance it on a tripod better. It is an Arca style tripod collar, so you don't need uh, uh, the special plate. You can leave the plate on your camera body, like on my body, my plate's already on it. But this will just take the camera off, slap it right on, body will hang off the back, lens, lens will totally carry it up. I'll talk to about him in a second. That's kind of a cool piece. Then I brought the R5, Canon R5. There are rumors of an R5 Mark II. Rumors. Unfortunately, we don't find about that stuff officially to like two days before their release. So any of the rumor sites, you probably know just about as much information as we do. Okay. Um, very rarely will the, if the rep comes in, they may nod their heads, but they can't say anything. <laughs> um, but this has their 28 to 70, 2.0 all the way through on it. So if you really need the speed all the way through and can't handle a one-stop drop off, but don't mind clipping yourself on the range, this guy is front heavy. Um, but the R5, and there are variations of the R5. There's an R5C, and the difference between the R5 and the R5C is the R5C is optimized towards video. It has a cine mode, okay? Um, the difference between the cine mode video and the video on here, the video on here is like any other camera. You've got some video controls. You can do your 4K. You can do your 6K. But when you go to the R5C, the cine mode is more like their video cine cinematography cameras. It's a totally different menu system, kind of rocked out for those people that are primary video. The catches, they are power hungry. So if you go for the cine, because you like to do your video, um, I would highly recommend, instead of using the LPE6 batteries, which Canon likes to use, uh, which would give you 20 minutes, then you kill the battery. Not 20 minutes and you're done with video because your memory card can't handle it. 20 minutes, you're killing the battery. Um, uh, Isaac, who works downtown, has one, and he's got a power bank that sits up on top. It's very, a, a very specific power bank that he loves. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know the name of it, um, but if you call, I can ask him. And you will get 12 hours of time on that power bank. Okay. So if you are a heavy video person, I would highly recommend, and it's not something we carry, so I'd highly recommend that power bank and then have a cage or something. That way you can do the mic, you can do the lights, and you will be totally rigged out. With the C, no. Now, I'm gonna amend that slightly. With the 1080 and 4K, no. If you push 8K for that entire time, in the later parts of that time, okay, maybe she might overheat. Because 8K video does really work it. But the Cine one has extra fans and heat sinks to help prevent that. This guy on 8K, yeah, she'll, she'll overheat. She doesn't like it too much. Small clips, you're good, but don't try to do a, like a full wedding with a standard one. Do an 8K. 4K, you'd, you'd be totally fine. And the funny red stickers you see on a lot of these basically means these are actually sitting in our rental department. They are rentable. Okay. Uh, this is Nikon Z8. Started out kind of uh, had a little couple of bad reputations. Uh, the first batch that got out, uh, the lens mount was cracking. Not good. So they fixed it. They recalled them, fixed them. Second and third batches came out. The strap lugs were breaking. <laughs> Again, recalled. Um, but now we're about the eighth or ninth batch in, and they've been rock solid ever since. 
So a couple of bugs on a, you know, a little rough start, but she's been pretty good so far. And there's a lot of people, I'm just gonna say a lot of people, there's a fair amount of people who came and got the Z9, which is basically bigger because it has that bigger grip part on the bottom. And they came back and actually downgraded to the Z8. The Z9 is a, it's a tank. The problem is it's a, it's a tank. Um, this can do 99% of what the Z9 can do. And if you don't mind not having that extra power grip, she's just as good and you're less money. Okay. Um, the screen does not swing out like Canon's. It kind of sweeps out, but you can still do low level stuff. Kids, dogs, plants, you know, I can shoot straight down. Or if you're short like me, over the head of tall people. Okay, this is a this is a used Fuji. Sorry, I grabbed the wrong lens. I wanted to grab a long lens like this for the Fuji. Um, I walked out the door. It was sitting there on the middle counter. <laughs> it's like, dang it. Um, this is the, actually a 12-year-old X-T1. Okay, the two I had in the showcase, batteries were dead. So, but there's a specific reason why I brought this one. Actually, it's two reasons. One. It shows that, hey, we carry used gear, okay? And at the Cleveland store, we have four showcases filled with used digital stuff and one showcase dedicated towards classic film stuff. So medium format, old classic Leicas, Pentax, Nikons, some of the old classic lenses. This specific one and the reason why it runs 850 bucks for a 12-year-old camera versus maybe 400 that it should be, this has been infrared converted. So the sensor on this one is an infrared sensor at, I think, 850 nanometers. So for those people that don't know infrared, uh, actually, the one guy's going to be talking about infrared, uh, uh, the, the SIG meeting. Guess what? This is, this is one of those that's already been converted. What's that? Looks like a 590? Okay, maybe I'm wrong on, on the nanometer. Okay. Um, but that's cool on that. We do carry Fuji. Okay. So this beast of a lens, this is uh, the OM Systems OM-1. Technically, it's, not, it's an Olympus, but it's not an Olympus. Olympus America sold the camera division to a group out of Japan called JIP. So Olympus America does not own the camera division, JIP does. So, but in order to keep name recognition, they renamed their cameras to OM, which is their old manual film style. And Olympus said, cool. This is the OM-1 Mark II. This is six months old, I think, okay. Um, this can do, I'm going to say 20 frames a second, um, 120 frames per second on video, uh, has a built-in four and eight stop neutral density. And the built-in stabilizer, most of these cameras have built-in stabilizers effective to maybe four to five stops. According to Olympus and whatever rating system they do, almost eight stops. So throw away your monopod and maybe not even carry your tripod around in other places that normally you would. Plus with live exposure on the back, not necessarily live exposure, but if you do nighttime solar photography, as you start to take the photo and your exposure is like minutes long, you can watch the photo develop back here and you go, stop, I like that. Okay, so if you like to do star trails, you can watch the star trails start to show up, you know, check back every five minutes, see if they're as long as you want, and then say, stop, okay. Um, I put on it, they're 150 to 600, not the fastest lens, it's a, it's a five to six three. Okay, but because Olympus uses the micro four thirds sensor, which is about a quill of maybe a half frame for those people that are using full frame cameras, 
this 150 to 600 is the equivalent of a 300 to 1200. And it's actually pretty light, considering I'm holding a 1200 millimeter lens. If you really wanted to try to shoot that solar eclipse, <laughs> that might be one to play with. Unfortunately, not in the rental department. Okay. Classic Hasselblad from the film days. This is a 501 um, from the, I think, uh, 80s. The reason why I brought this guy is because I brought this guy. This is the um, 907X, which is basically a digital Hasselblad. Uh, 100 megapixel, 645 style sensor versus the normal film being 6x6 square. So that right there, that's your, kind of like more like your 645 sensor. Bought twice as big as a traditional full frame. About 8,500 bucks. But there's my digital Hasselblad. Back straight up fits on your 500 series bodies. And you would view down like this. Live view doesn't work back here anymore. But when you take the picture, obviously the photo comes right back up. So this stores the digital image. This basically becomes a digital back. Your lens works, everything else works. And let's see if I can. Can't guarantee that was a good exposure. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little warm, but. Is this still capturing it on film too? No. <laughs> You'd have to switch the backs. And it's a touch screen, so you can zoom in and you could really, I mean, with as sharp as some of the Hasselblad lenses are, yeah, you could zoom in and see uh, somebody's freckles and pores and stuff like that. Don't ask me why you'd want to zoom that tight, but you can. <coughs> Any questions or anything so far? I, I might be talking fast. I tend to do that. All right. Check with it. Uh, I brought two flashes with me, and then I'll get to the last few pieces. Uh, we carry a couple different brands of flashes. Obviously, the manufacturer's flashes, the Nikon SB500 and 5000, the Canon 600 and the EL1s, uh, the Sony's HVL F45s and 58s or 60s, whatever numbers they put there. Um, can't say I necessarily have a Fuji flash new, no, but that's okay. We carry Godox brand flashes, which are very brand specific. So if you need a new... Uh, flash, uh, make sure you grab one specifically, uh, and you can kind of tell specifically by what that letter is. This is for Olympus, uh, aka also Panasonic, which I did not grab a Panasonic because nothing was charged. I wanted to grab the GH6, but sorry, Panasonic shooters, but I brought your Olympus instead. Uh, we also carry the Westcott FJ80 series. This is a brand new one called the SE versus the standard Mark II. The difference between the SE and the Mark II, the Mark II has a slightly better lithium polymer battery, which gives a recycle rate of like 0.3 seconds to 1.3 seconds for, I think it's 500 full blast flashes. Most people never shoot at full blast, so you're talking you could shoot 700 to 1,000 photos in TTL mode because that's going to fluctuate your power. The SE uses a lithium ion battery, good for about 400 flashes, or about 20% less, but the price point is also about 100 bucks less. It's like 330 versus I think 200. So very you know, price effective flash. The nice thing about the Westcott FJ80 series is it's multi-dedicated. So for everybody, and I'm gonna put a little star by Sony there for a second, and I'll put another star there for Leica and Pentax. For anybody else, you get one flash, the one with the letter M on it, and let's say I'm 
doing a demo and I'm going to throw it on my, on my cannon. Doop, doop, flick it to cannon. It's dedicated to cannon. I'm going to put it on my Nikon. Do a little change. It's ready for Nikon. It's ready for Olympus. It's ready for Pantex. It's, or sorry, it's ready for um, Panasonic. It's ready for Fuji. Uh, the Sony one, it's ready for. However, the Sony uh, shoe mount's a little different, so you may need a little, uh, either a little adapter to get it to read through the Sony system or get the FJ80 that says has the letter S there and it's already set for the Sony multi-terminal control. Uh, it is not, to my chagrin, uh, dedicated to uh, a Pentax system. And every time the rep comes in, I says, if you make this thing to a Pentax, I'm going to go completely to your system. But right now I'm using two Pentax flashes and a 25-year-old Pro Photo Compact 600 for some for my studio stuff, so it works. Uh, then we get into. Um, and I brought these last time, just because this is what's in my bag. In my bag, I have my personal Pentax K1. They actually have a Mark II. This is very similar to like Nikon's D850, Canon's 5D Mark IV. Um, but where this guy is, there's a couple things different about this guy. One, the nice thing is she's a tank. The problem is she's a tank. Okay. So the back screen not only sweeps out, does some cool rotational things. Okay. But because it's held together by four metal joints, I can do this and not rip the screen off. Everybody freaks out when I do that. <laughs> um, the few other reasons why I shoot it is that in the black and white mode, and most of these cameras have a black and white mode, and you can usually pick filters, red, blue, green. I think Canon has five different filter effects for uh, black and white, and Icon's kind of the same. There's like 12. And the one that I like is infrared. I can shoot infrared black and white effect. It's not a true infrared because it's not an infrared filter. But it is giving me the white vegetation that a black and white infrared would get, which is, I kind of like that effect. So I'm always doing raw plus JPEG. Yes? So you get to shoot JPEG when you do that? For the infrared black and white, because it's modified, it is not a raw. So I tend to do raw plus JPEG. My raw is my raw, and my JPEG is the infrared black and white. And I was at one of the um, uh, field trips to Mansfield Reformatory uh, pre-COVID. I think it was like the last one they did before COVID happened. And the, for those of you that have been there, there's the, the hallway with the light X, if you kind of hit there right, okay. If, and it goes up the stairs. If you flip behind you, there's the four-way hallway and there's the chair and there. Okay, well, at that intersection, I'm actually looking right, hallway down, okay. And I'm kind of shooting this and I got my camera in black and white mode and I see something, I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird, so I change it. Shoot it in color, shoot it normal black and white, go back to infrared and I see this weird thing again. I can show you the photo, normal black and white and infrared black and white and there's two different black splotches that my infrared black and white's picking up on and I have no clue what it is. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's a ghost, I'm just saying it's weird. <laughs> What's that? No, it was like tripod mounted like this and the first time I saw it I go that's weird and I go so I changed it off of infrared to just normal black and white and it disappeared. I'm like that's weird. Moved it back to infrared and it reappeared on me. So I got no idea. This, is, this came out last year, just over a year ago. This is the Pentax K3 Mark III monochrome. Okay. For those people that like to shoot black and white, this only shoots black and white. It does not shoot color at all. If you shoot raw, it's black and white. Okay. Um, the cool thing about it is if you were a heavy black and white shooter, your tonality 
a raw black and white's got like this much tonality to it versus a JPEG black and white. Okay. But it also, with the Pentax system in general, uh, the best backwards cam compatibility to older lenses. They've used the same K mount, lens mount, for, I mean, the past 50, 60 years. And then with a simple $20 screw thread to K mount adapter, you can use all their old screw mount Takamar stuff all the way back from the, the very beginning. So best backwards compatibility. Now, the downside is, is that in the popularity scale of things, yeah, they're the low man on the totem. Okay. It goes, it goes uh, uh, Canon, Sony, Nikon, kind of your top three. Uh, Fuji, Panasonic, probably your next tier. You get Olympus and Pentax there and probably Leica down there. Um, so not a lot of third party, major third party lens support, Tamron and Sigma, they've kind of gone towards those, those three big boys. They've dabbed a little bit for Fuji and Olympus, but most of it's for uh, the other mirrorless ones. Um, but for me, I, this, I mean, I don't shoot a lot of sports. I don't shoot a lot of uh, video, but I have found myself in weird weather situations and they are some of the most rugged cameras that are out there. And then my last one is, it's, this is probably a 30 year old point and shoot film camera. Reason why I brought this, one, just to say, hey, there's some new films out if you have your old film camera. Uh, uh, Ilford came up with a color film called Phoenix. Um, uh, Kentmere, which is also by Ilford. It's another variation of black and white. Uh, Cinestill has a couple of cool color films. And then there's some exotic stuff from Film Photography Project. And um, there's another company out there I can't think of. But the biggest reason why I brought this is that the first time in 15 years, a new compact film cameras coming to market. It's, I don't know if it's going to have the Pentax badge on it or the Ricoh badge because Pentax is owned by Ricoh. But if you do some YouTube search, they've, they've had three, you know, here's, some, here's a little bit of information. Here's a little bit more information. Here's a little bit more information. Um, the information I know is that instead of shooting like this, the kind of want you to shoot it like this because this is a cell phone world and people shoot their cell phones like this. Okay, so your hold factor is going to be slightly different. The other thing I know is it's going to be a half frame camera. So instead of a roll of 24 shots giving you 24 photos, the roll of 24 is going to give you 48. Okay, our lab can do that just fine. What you're going to get though is two photos per four by six. So we're not going to give you the individuals. It'll be like, you get, there's your first two shots. There's your next two shots. There's your next two shots. Our machines aren't designed to handle a single half frame image, but they can handle them side by side. Uh, that's all I know about that camera. Uh, supposedly, uh, Rico is coming up with two film cameras. I'm oh, sorry, two compact film cameras, standard one and a prestige one. And then, I guess, if all goes well, two interchangeable lens ones. Probably a standard and a prestige one. Any questions? Otherwise, feel free to come up, handle them. Um, I didn't want to hand them around just because of the fact that, you know, I didn't want, want them to drop or anything, because it's my neck if they do. Uh, ask me questions. Grab a, uh, grab a rental voucher. Grab one of my cards. If you want my Instagram handle. Feel free to come on up. Yes? Do we get any rentals for the solar eclipse? Uh, we, uh, as far as lens and camera rentals, sure. Uh, we don't rent the filters, so. Uh, you talked about the, the Phoenix film. Yes. Apparently some places have issues scanning it. Yes. Yeah. I absolutely do. So normal black and white film and then normal color film. Normal black and white film has a gray base to it. Okay. 
Um, and there's your, there's your negative. Normal color film has a brown base to it. 99% of the machines that are out there, including ours, is color is on brown base, black and white's on gray base. If you take a look at Phoenix film, it is a color negative on gray base. It's messing with the older machines. Our machine doesn't like it. Because our machine's like a 20 year old machine. Now, I think there's some place in Cleveland, and I don't remember the name of it, but one of my coworkers knows the name of it. They've got a newer machine, and they can scan Phoenix a little bit better and maybe print it. Um, I've got a roll in, in this camera right now, uh, and when I'm done shooting it, I've got a Canon scanner at home. I'm going to try to play with it, but I haven't, uh, I haven't finished it yet. In fact, I don't think I've taken a photo on it yet. Uh, any other questions? Okay. I would say come. Okay. Yeah. Come Feel free to come on up and handle the cameras.
Mike's on. Mike's on. For those of you at home, not in the audience, for those of you at home, we are still here. I have checked on the judges. They are okay. Um, they are still judging, so we'll be underway shortly. Take a bathroom break, whatnot. Uh, we will keep the cameras going live here until the judges uh, come in.
Okay. For those at home, the pictures are now on their way in um, as well. For those in the audience, we'll just settle down. Settle down. That's right. We'll get the pictures in place. We'll get our judges in place. We'll have the judges then introduce themselves, and we will get underway. You want to get mic'd up or at least take the mics? They're over here. You could take... Capita, that's live. Okay, welcome tonight to our uh, nature competition for Spohn. Uh, we'll get underway right now. I think we will uh, start off with having the uh, judges just introduce themselves. Uh, who wants to be? Oh, there we go. Here's first. Okay. 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 Can oh, perfect. Yep. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, um, Lori Diemer from Willoughby, Ohio, is a very active member of Western Reserve for many, many years, and got to know a lot of you over here by coming and judging and seeing all your beautiful work. I haven't been here since before COVID, BC, I guess is the term. And it's great. It, I haven't been out with my camera in a long time just because of the creative work I do. And, and boy, you guys have inspired me to grab my, my camera, my big gear more often and um, not my phone, <laughs> because it's easy, right? So um, glad to be here and wonderful images tonight. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey folks, Glenn Petranic here. I've been here often before. I've judged, presented, and many other things going way back to when you guys were on Superior Road. Um, Great, always great to be back. Some of the best images I find here are coming from CPS. Uh, once again, if we all talk about our knees, it's uh, for some reason it seems to be January, February, the knee problems kicked in. I got an infected right knee, which I had replaced, which I'm now rehabbing, and uh, I'm good to go. So that, that's a good thing. Um, they saved the knee and my life, basically. Good, so good to have you back. Even better. So, so uh, but no, I've. Uh, I got a big year planned. I've got about 16 art shows scheduled. If you're ever out of the big ones, uh, Chagrin Falls, Kane Park, Willoughby, Lakewood, I should be there, stop in and say hi. And hopefully everything holds up. I'm headed to Italy in October. It's Mike Demeter, good to see everyone. Been here before, presented before and uh, judged before here also. Good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, professional photographer from Lake County for many years and right now I'm teaching at Lake Erie College uh, photography digital classes as an adjunct faculty member so that keeps me busy and it's just always a pleasure to see the quality of work out of your club so thanks for having me back I know uh, Eric from uh, Dodds and worked there for a little while too so uh, probably some familiar faces that I met as my years there so Great to see everybody. Great to see the work. And uh, here we go. Who wants to start? Ladies. Okay, I guess. <laughs> okay, love this. Um, good, good timing on this photo. Um, the, I'm a little distracted by the mallard in the back, but you can't control that. I think the lighting, the exposure is, is right on. It's lovely. Um, 
exposure on this on this moose. Um, the one I, I love it, but I think um, what attracts me is the the water dripping, and that might have been the the main subject that attracted you to this this moose is this water dripping out. So maybe tighter in on just that portion, make it more of a portrait close in with this drama happening with the water dripping. Overall, enjoyable image. This image is called Moose Drool by Steve Georgie, 21 points. Nice, nice portrait of the, uh, of the bear here. It, uh, you know, good and sharp. I, I enjoyed the uh, good catch light in the eye. Um, just uh, a, a good position for it. Obviously, I don't hope you weren't very close. <laughs> you don't want to get too close to these bad boys. Um, if anything, I think maybe darkening down the top a little bit. I think there's a little bit of space over his head. There's a little bit too much. Maybe uh, get a little tighter on that and it'd be good to go. Bear by Mike Kopkis. Uh, 23 points, honorable mention. So very colorful image, a lot of contrast. The um, Obviously the story that's told here is uh, the eyes have it, I suppose. And uh, it's placed just a little bit off center, which I think helps. Uh, a couple diagonal lines going below. Um, and again, I, I think that the thing that makes this image attractive is the uh, color contrasts and so forth. So I think it tells a nice story. The image is called Sticky by Richard Schneider, 22 points. I so admire good bird photography and I really like this image. Everything's tack sharp, which is important when photographing critters and birds and animals. You gotta make sure the eye is sharp because that's most important, but the detail in the feathers and just this is the subject of the image and a nice blurred background no distractions and the um the base it just gives a little bit of the environment that this is, is a kookaburra or is i'm not quite sure i'm not a good bird id person but i love that the bottom gives a good idea of the habitat of this bird nicely done this is a black-cheeked woodpecker by Marge Brady, 25 points, third place. This is a beautiful image with a wonderful feel to it. The light from behind the cypress tree glowing on the uh, water. Uh, just, just incredible feel for this. Um, you know, very well done, beautiful capture of the time of day. Colors are great. Uh, if anything, I would tone down that little sky kind of in the upper right a little bit. I tend to lean into that direction. Um, I'm not sure if it can be cropped um, without losing what the beauty that you have here. Uh, I can go on the deep end. You can circle it and use uh, artificial intelligence filled in. No one will know, but I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, well, very well done, though. The image is called Lake Fausa by Donna Schneider. 26 points, second place. This image really draws you in with the um, multi-layering that happens uh, with the clouds and the uh, mist and so forth and just the hint of the spruce trees popping up. Um, a lot of movement, nice movement through the picture. Uh, you almost have a nice uh, kind of very interesting feel through it as the kind of the wind blows through and so forth and um, again I think this is a very well done tonalities uh, very nice and again the just layering is from top to bottom uh, makes this a, a keeper new dawn rising by Bob Kowaleski 26 points second place This is a beautiful portrait of these flowers. They look to be tiny. Um, so to even see them and notice them is, is half, half the challenge of doing uh, woodland photography. Um, everything's exposed beautifully. There's a couple little distracting highlights in the background, but it, it didn't 
take me away from the, the beauty of these three flowers. And I would almost um, go in after taking this shot and zoom in on those two buds that are hanging down below because there's a beautiful relationship happening between them. And I had a, a, a great uh, teacher in the photography of relationships, Nancy Rotenberg. I don't know if anybody here had the, the wonderful opportunity to do some work with her or get to know her, but it's all about what attracted you to the image and then just zero in on the essence. And, and I, I love this image, don't get me wrong, but then there's another story happening in the little buds. But beautiful image, I really liked it. Fringed Facelia by Susan Bestel, 22 points. Lee Ray has an interesting uh, image, especially from a color standpoint. Uh, placement, I think, is very, very good, um, where you have the center of the flower kind of not centered off a little bit. Uh, I think it adds a bit of uh, power to the image. Uh, I really enjoyed the different colors and all the different shapes and textures. Uh, one thing I may recommend, which I know a lot of people do, I noticed he had the, it's pretty much all purple around the outside edge, darken the edge down. There's different techniques for edge darkening. I think if you darken the edge, the center, I think, will just jump at you. Poppy by Marge Brady, 23 points, honorable mention. Uh, wonderful to tonalities in this also, uh, between the background of the browns and the dragonfly, the reds and so forth. Uh, work very nicely. The um, placement is pretty good. I might have been a little bit more pleased with the branch coming maybe from the lower left hand bottom across and uh, giving the um, the image a little bit more room to breathe on the right hand side but all in all very nice soft background focus. Um, the tonality in the wood works out very nicely. You can see some detail in there. And again, the uh, capture uh, technically was well done. Red Dragon by Steve Georgie, 22 points. Ah, uh, Lioness. Um, I just, this was a wow for me. Everything's sharp. There's attitude with the ears up. Sometimes in, in photographing critters with the ears, if they're back, it kind of, okay, he's angry, but I like that there's attention in this animal and his gaze. And I just think it's very well exposed and a beautiful portrait of this, this creature. Lioness by Mike Kopkis, 25 points, third place. I'm not sure if it's a hand or a foot. I'm going to say a foot. But uh, uh, claw? Okay, maybe more of a claw. I don't know. But uh, ve very uh, interesting uh, texture to this is what uh, really comes out of this, is the texture in the skin and uh, the different colors, gradations in the, in the scales, I think, are, are pretty interesting. I personally like to see it uh, in a way, if you can get it almost a little closer to eliminate some of the dirt around it, I, I know that's a part of the image and where the creature is, but uh, I think if somehow get a little bit tighter, it might be a little better. Blue Hand by Bill Keaton, 22 points. Well, you can really follow the flow of the water, obviously, from top to bottom, and it creates a nice movement through the picture. Again, the uh, tonalities... Pretty much all the browns and the greens, I think, lend themselves nicely to this also. Um, the, the movement, I think, is probably the main portion of this picture that gives its impact. Uh, I might have cropped maybe just a little bit over the top, possibly. And uh, I think, as Glenn alluded to in one of his pictures, I think maybe a little vignetting around the edges might have helped keep you in this image just a little bit more also, but well done. Norwegian Falls by Eric Wethington, 19 points. This is a beautiful portrait of this animal. I can't, I'm not going to identify, <laughs> but um, I, there was a 
the monochromatic is nice, but I'm almost, um, I would like to see more of the expression. Um, it's a nice portrait, don't get me wrong, um, but it's just there. Um, I'd maybe zoom in or crop in to see the beauty in the face and the expression on the animal a little bit more. Deer by Jen Cockrell, 19 points. This takes a look at first because it, you, you wonder what, what the heck you got here. And what you've got is a uh, pretty fascinating reflection. Um, I give the uh, maker kudos for uh, seeing this. Um, it is uh, pretty interesting the fact that where the, the uh, alligator's hand touches the water and the tail makes a continual loop uh, is, is really interesting. Uh, one thing, if anything, I would do is that uh, the only th that bothers me a little bit, reflection is, I think, could use it to be toned down a little bit. A lot of reflections are a little bit darker than the top. So maybe darken down that sky area at the bottom if possible. But uh, pretty uh, unique take on this, on this animal. Reflecting on the Okie Finoki by, by Mike Lonsdale, 23 points, honorable mention. I think the first thing that, that attracted me to this is the detail within the, the wing and the texture on the, the animal itself. Uh, then as you move through the picture, the nice movement of the water beneath uh, captures and keeps you in the frame nicely also. Um, background is dark and simple and keeps your eye on the subject. Again, just to be a little picky up in the right hand top corner, a little bit of highlight that maybe draws you up there and possibly a little bit of the highlight between the, uh, the animal's head and, and wing maybe could be toned down also. But the reflection in the water and the movement in the water and the uh, detail um, makes this a nice image. White Wing by John Paganini, 22 points. This is a lovely portrait of fall. I've taken many of these, um, and these two leaves certainly have a relationship going on. But I almost, I, it looks like polarizer was used, but I'd almost dial it back a little bit because sometimes there's tension that appears around these leaves when they're floating um, that might have added a little more interest to this, this image. And I would probably would have cropped in a little bit more just to, to get the, the flow a little bit more contained between the two leaf patterns. Two Floating Leaves by Susan Bestel, 20 points. Wonderful capture of this bird. Uh, like Laurie, I, I'm terrible at uh, naming birds, so I won't even try. To me, it's a bird. So anyhow, but it's, it's a darn good image, though. Uh, the, uh, I, I kind of enjoy how the branches are crossed, where it's kind of sitting right there in that apex. Uh, the eye is, is dead sharp. There's space in front of it. And uh, the background, even though uh, you it's a little bit lighter in some spots. It's not distracting. I think it sets it in its place. So well done. Song Sparrow by Gary Bloom. 24 points. Honorable mention. Well, as you view this image, the first thing I probably come in contact with is the, the eye and the tilt of the head. And as the uh, eagle is... Yeah searching for prey. I mean, it tells, a, it tells a great story right off the bat. And then technically, capturing the, um, the detail and the motion works out well. Backlighting, uh, lighting in general seems to work out well. Pale blue sky lends itself. You know, so I find myself looking for the top of that wing, I suppose, a little bit. Uh, rather than having it uh, merged and cut off a bit, but that's the nature of uh, animal photography a little bit. And But all in general, the, you know, the talons being ready, it just looks like this, um, it tells a wonderful story and the bird is uh, ready for its prey. The image is entitled Ready to Strike by Bill Naiman, a perfect score of 27 points, first place. Whoa. 
Is Bill here? Bill's getting a rhythm. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Is Bill here? Yeah, Bill's here. This is great habitat, shot habitat. Um, this heron, I've got to get over to that rookery and get myself some of these, these photos, maybe this spring. Um, but I, I love the, uh, the position of the bird in the frame. It's, it's got room to fly off to the right. And I love the, the little detail of the trees down in the lower right. Did I? Oh, I'm on. And um, it just tells a great story. This guy's uh, helping build a nest, this night guy or gal. Lovely shot. Hoping for a Mate by Dennis Wirt. 23 points, honorable mention. This room image really has just about everything going for it, uh, from the exposure to the detail and the highlights and the snow the detail in the mountains, the amount, rule of thirds, uh, you can go all the way with that if you want, you know, from the grasses to the, ho to the horses and all the way up. Just a very nice image. Grand Teton Herds by David Korosek, 24 points, honorable mention. I had to kind of search through this a little bit to find, because it's such a camouflaged um, item in here that uh, it really was interesting once I found the center of interest, um, how I, my eye moved back and forth through this image from focus to non-focus to sharp to non-sharp and so forth. Um, you know, so any, the detail is very nice and so forth, and the, eye, the capture of the eye and so forth I think works out well. The only thing I might have done, there's a, it seems like a, there's a lot of area on the bottom of the shot that might be a little distracting and maybe the out of focus might have been um, brought up a little bit by cropping. Um, but um, all in all, I think it's a good capture and uh, very interesting. Mesmerized by Joe Smith, 20 points. Another beautiful eagle shot. Um, looks like he's got some nesting material as well. I, I'm a little distracted by the very bright up at the top. Um, and I would have liked to seen him have a little more room to fly into to the left. And it's also, you know, it's kind of like watching a river flow right to left. It's kind of unnatural, but I get it. You can't control the way the, the eagles fly, but he is tack sharp. The exposure, the lighting is beautiful on this, this uh, majestic bird. I would just tone down the top or maybe even crop some of that, that white sky out a little bit, but lovely image. Bald Eagle Carrying Branch by Tyler Kleeman. Uh, 23 points, honorable mention. I really, <clears throat> excuse me. I really enjoyed this image, mainly because the lighting is superb. It has just a wonderful feel. You've got plenty of detail in the shadows, which is kind of tough to maintain. The, the highlight detail in the waterfall and so forth, with the highlights at the top and the bottom. Just uh, a, a great feel for this, you know, all the way around. Conkles Hollow Waterfall by Bob Koaleski, 26 points, second place. Uh, another a nice capture of tack sharp around the eyes, the um, detail and so forth and the lighting I think work out very nicely on this. Uh, the base that is in the shot that where the um, bird can stand on I think actually gives it a nice feel and weight to the foundation. Uh, background is uh, very, very well lit and um, very simple and plain, which doesn't distract at all. Uh, placement seems to be very good, so um, uh, well done. Carolina Wren by 
Gary Bloom, 23 points, honorable mention. Beautiful capture of this, looks like a silver fox or an arctic fox. Um, interesting light in the eye, but that doesn't bother me. Uh, eyes again are sharp, which is important as I mentioned before. I'd almost, I'm not seeing anything of interest in the right portion of this. I think that's a paw or a leg, but it's kind of a, a little, I'm not quite sure. I know it's part of the critter, but it, I don't think it lends anything to the beauty in the face and the eyes. So I'd either tone it down a little bit, make it less distracting, or maybe even crop in for a nice vertical portrait here. The Sly Fox by Bill Keaton, 20 points. I'm going to go on, uh, <clears throat> go off the rail here and say this is probably an egret, um, <laughs> snowy type. I'm going to see a few of these in pictures before. I've never seen one in real, believe it or not. But wonderful image of it. The lighting is, uh, is, is, is spectacular on it. Um, and the detail in the bird from the eye to the uh, plumage and everything else just all holds together. I really enjoyed the darker background. Um, if anything, you make it go a little tighter on it even. It's... Uh, Quite a bit of darkness around it, but that is just personal preference at that point. Seventh Feather Itch by Keith Marchand, 25 points, third place. Well, this could be a good Think Spring image. The mm -hmm. coloration is um, beautiful. Um, a lot of different things going on in here. I. I the only thing I have a little issue with is what, what story is this telling a bit. Um, there's uh, so many different varieties of flowers. I suppose that's good. There's a kind of a big uh, blank green space in the lower area that maybe could be f maybe a little bit nicer filled in, possibly. The uh, little daisies, I think, up on the top are getting a little soft, and maybe there was, maybe they could... Be, our eyes kind of are taken up there. I wonder just whether um, they need to be even included in the shot. I'm not quite sure whether uh, cropping them down and drawing the viewer's attention down into the lower part of the picture might be, might be well done. Spring Flowers by Dale Cowan, 19 points. This is an interesting picture. I've never seen a butterfly. Um, is that... Oh, he's on a flower. I thought it was a spider for a moment. Um, but I like the lineup of everything from the um, spent bud to the bud that the butterfly is on. So it is a nice diagonal line in this competition, and the exposure on the butterfly is, is really nice. Um, it's just the distract distractions of the highlights in the background. If we could go in there and tone them down a little bit, um, would improve this image and direct the viewer right on to the subject. Swallowtail and Flower by Paul Gilia, 21 points. Very nice autumn waterfall. Uh, leaves are just a perfect color for this. Uh, placement on the water is nice. Uh, everything's very well exposed. The water is not uh, blown out or anything like that. I'd almost like you could try a couple different compositions. This could make a good vertical also, uh, where you have everything off to the left. Looks nice, but is it really complementing the water? I would uh, you know, try a vertical on it too and see what you think. Falling Waters by Catherine Kengat, 21 points. It's a very interesting image as, as uh, compositionally. Uh, the reflection is very well done in this also. I think um, the softness of the reflection, I think, helps really work this out nicely. The timing is wonderful. The splashes of the water. So many elements in this work out very nicely. Uh, the tonality, the sharpness is good. Timing is good. Again, um, any any constructive criticism possibly might be maybe there's a little too much area over the top, maybe may, may making this more into a little bit of a panorama look, 
possibly. There's not too much going on up there. My eye is drawn up to the top a bit by the light brown that goes on there. But um, all in all, um, very well done. Time for Lunch by Fran Marino, 22 points. The impact on this is the color um, for me. And I'm not sure, I, I kind of would like to see this subject kind of in a diagonal. It seems pretty static with its current composition. I mean, all the, the stamens are in, um, are in sh sharp focus, which is great. Um, and maybe, maybe if that was the main draw of the photographer as the subject were these pollen heads, to maybe do a little bit of vignetting on the outside to help direct the viewer into the center more. Belladonna Lily by Dave Saborik, 19 points. Interesting uh, capture here. You got the, uh, the orca breaching, uh, the lights right on. I really enjoy how the uh, uh, water is, is coming off of it. Um, you have some other orca, it looks like, in the uh, foreground, kind of leading you into it. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a really, really interesting capture. I know in situations like this, it's going to be, you know, things are going to happen at a moment's notice. I'd love to see this tighter. I'm not sure how much the foreground itself is, it tends to get blended into the darkness of the water. But uh, all in all, it's, a, you know, great timing and, uh, you know, you got it. Whale Ballet by Dennis Swart, 23 points, honorable mention. A very nice portrait. Um, the, uh, again, the uh, tonalities and so forth work out well. Um, the, I think the merging possibly is a little tight for me. The uh, possibly over the head maybe needs just a little bit more room and I'm looking to see on the bottom maybe just a little bit more of the of the uh, paw and legs itself a little bit. Tonality's good. Again, I mentioned the um, uh, the placement of the of the head it goes along with a nice uh, compositional theme for us and um, lighting looks nice from left to right as it washes across and gives an, uh, the, the side lighting gives a nice feel of uh, detail and texture. Crouching Tiger by John Paganini, 19 points. Just lovely capture here. I mean, I think what made this image is the background. Well, the subject, of course, is, is beautiful and it's sharp, but the background is absolutely no distractions. It's a nice, even blended color that really highlights the subject. And when you're doing macro, macro, macro photography like this, the background is just as important as the sharpness of the subject and the story you're telling. So I think this is a lovely image. The exposure's dead on and um, nicely composed. A Bee at Rest, Belinda Prince, 24 points, honorable mention. Yeah, here's the image everybody goes to Yellowstone, Smokies, or wherever to get. In fact, uh, sometimes some people walk up to them and try to pet them. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. we won't go there either. But no, great capture here of the uh, Grizzly Mama and her family. Uh, I'm sure this, uh, you know, we had to be zooming in on this because you don't want to be close, especially with cubs. Um, at that point, I would almost take and crop this a little tighter. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful and mm -hmm. adorable and just... Uh, just, just a great moment seeing the bear and, and her young ones. A Grizzly Family Portrait by Bill Naiman, 24 points, honorable mention. I think the impact of this whole picture and the story it's telling is over, obviously, with the bird and the reflection uh, on the right-hand side. and. Uh, Again, the tonality and the softness of the of the reflection, I think, tells a story here. There's a lot of nice um, vertical striping going up and down in this picture that almost uh, looks like it's a 
uh, drawn with a long shutter release, but uh, obviously it's not. But I think that maybe the choice of the either focal length lens uh, might have given this a nice compression also. So I think the, the uses of the lens was good. So again, I, I think it's just a little, for me, a little bit too tight to the right. Um, I would maybe uh, give it a crap a little bit in from the left hand side almost to the edge where that branch comes into the water and I think it would give it maybe a little bit better composition. Blue Heron on Rocky River by Dale Cowan, 20 points. Ah, oh, I know this is a, a robin. <laughs> it looks like a robin. <laughs> Don't go. Lovely, lovely image. I mean, I always wonder how how many pictures it took to get this one with the with the berry right there. I, I admire the patience of photographers that it's, get this kind of shot. Um, lighting exposure is wonderful, and I love the very soft focus branches in the background. The only distraction is the almost same colored leaf on the right edge that. It's about the same color as the bird, so I'm going back and forth with that. So I, I would even crop in to, you know, over the left edge or the right edge of that trunk. I mean, that whole part, it just doesn't do anything for me. But I think it's a lovely capture and just, just cropping in, even up to the trunk if you want to leave, leave a little sliver of, of white there. But um, nice capture here. Robin Eating a Berry by Tyler Kleiman, 20 points. Well, this is a, a great image of the wolf here. I mean, just head on, he's walking at you with purpose. Uh, the eyes are fantastic. Uh, tonality in the uh, fur, I mean, just, just a wonderful shot here. You know, and obviously taken in the, uh, in the snowy wilderness where these animals thrive. Uh, if anything, it was, to me, there's almost too much white. I like to see a little tighter. Once again, personal preference, but uh, nice job. Winter Coyote by Keith Marchand. Okay, Coyote. 22 points. Let's see. Uh, nice detail in the feathers and so forth. Uh, I like the... The neck, as far as creating a bit of an S-curve, actually adds a nice feel to the picture also. Um, nice and tack sharp. I think the uh, possibility of maybe the little horizontal lines that are happening on the left side of the picture might distract a little bit. Um, but uh, all in all, I think a nice capture and uh, the tonalities and the sharpness work out well. Um, so, I think well done. Snowy Egret Gone Fishing by Mike Lonsdale, 21 points. Yay, another butterfly, by. Beautifully done. Um, I'm just seeing the, the dew drop on the, um, the bottom of that. Tweet. That's a nice touch, too. But the light on this butterfly is beautiful. Um, it's just, again... Check your backgrounds. I don't know if, if the photographer had a diffuser with them or able to cover or somehow shadow the distracting background. It's a lot of light spots back there. Sometimes I have a, a large diffuser that if I can, I'll either have somebody hold it over the background to tone it down um, and cut some of those bright spots. Um, sometimes you don't have that opportunity, and these guys are skittish most of the time. So nice capture, but try and maybe in, in post, if you can, tone down some of those bright spots to bring more attention to the butterfly. Butterfly After Rain by Paul Gilia, 19 points. Interesting images. Took a moment to figure out what we had going on here. But it looks like uh, you know, you're some type of bird, duck, or whatever, I'm not sure, dipping its head into the water, and you're seeing the water come up over the head in a sheet, which uh, I thought was uh, a pretty interesting capture there. I mean, uh, to get that, the speed that you'd have to capture at, and the timing would be incredible. Um, 
If anything, I'd like to see a little more above the, uh, the animal's neck there, but all in all, to get that, good job. Immersion by Joe Smith, 20 points. Very nice feel to this. Uh, nice detail. Placement is good. Uh, it seems to be sharp from top to bottom. I think the vertical capture works out well. Uh, again, maybe I, again, maybe just need to see a little bit more tonality or a little bit more contrast in this. It seems, I mean, personally, it um, seems to be almost monochromatic, although it is have, has a green hue to it. Um, but um, again, the placement tonality seems to be all right. I just think it maybe just a little bit um, needs a little bit of maybe more contrast to maybe give it a little bit more impact. Butterfly Agave by Dave Saborik, 20 points. Oh, and if, if I can just admit, there's like 50 pictures in this one for me. <laughs> I mean, just to zoom in on those details, I hope the photographer spent some time with this because they are fascinating plants. And I'm just seeing like the overlapping petals and the spikes and the zooming in and just getting as close as I can in, in this whole, I could spend like three hours on a, critter, on a subject like this. But um, again, it's like, finding the subject and I usually take the record shot and then I'm like okay what really attracted me to this plant and this photographer captured I'm, I'm just that's just my personal thought but oh I see a lot of pictures in this one <laughs> okay that concludes the nature portion now we'll start on the uh, pictorial I, I enjoyed all the colors in this one you have uh, uh, obviously, it looks like a uh, type of fishing village. It's uh, some nice reflections in the water of the boats and just kind of leads all the way in. I'm assuming some type of telephoto lens was used here because it's really compressed, almost to the point of being jumbled a little bit, but I think the colors help pull it out. Fisherman's Wharf by Mike Kapkus, 22 points. Simplicity of the background and so forth really draws our attention right into the focal point, which is the head and eye and so forth. Works, works very well. Uh, placement of the um, fr frog itself possibly is maybe a, a little too centered for me a bit, but um, it kind of takes away from the movement just a little bit. But the impact of this and the coloration, the saturation of the colors is what makes the shot. Uh, lighting is nice. Uh, Brings a lot of texture and detail. Um, so I'm not quite sure about the base, what uh, this uh, frog is on. You know, it's a lot of red, and I'm kind of drawn down that way a bit away from the just the powerful center of the head and eye. So uh, well done. Yellow-eyed tree frog by Marge Brady, 24 points, second place. I love the mood of this because um, I just love being in the water and I've fished every once in a while. Um, I, I almost, I like, the, again, it's the, the reflections of this are, are magical to me. And I would either cut, cut down from the top because there's really nothing exciting going on. There's beautiful color above, but maybe crop down or do a vertical. It's just these guys fishing in there just crop in uh, more to, from the left and leave a little space to the right, you know, where they have their fishing lines and their poles pointed. But um, I think a little, the subject is a little bit lost with all the grandeur of the trees. So I kind of crop in a little bit more to make the guys stand out a little bit more as a subject, because I think that's what that is. Two Guys Fishing by Susan Bestel, 21 points. Beautiful light here um, of, the, of the cave, the Hocking Hills, I imagine. Uh, just, just really striking. I love the warm tones reflecting all inside the rock, but yet you still have the greens from the forest coming in at, at their regular tones. So I really like the mixing of the light here. Uh, almost wish you could have been there on a, after a good rainfall, where you get that waterfall flowing, but uh, that place, you get what you get when you're there. Ash Cave, Hocking Hills, Ohio. 
Bob Koaleski, 24 points, second place. There's always beauty and simplicity, and this, I think, is what that image speaks to. Uh, just the lone animal um, and the beautiful western sky, I would have to think, works out uh, very nicely. Again, a lot of layering going on here, the nice green foreground all the way up into the pastels in the sky. Um, the horizon line, I think, is placed pretty well in this. I think if it would have been moved up a little bit, it would have kind of stagnated the picture a little bit, but it's just a little bit down from the center, which I think works out nicely. Um, lines flowing everywhere. You kept into the frame very nicely with his shots and a very nice silhouette of the, the bison, I think. So, well done. Solitary Bull by Bill Keaton, 23 points, third place. I like shots like this because you, you always see these guys from the front or the side or the back, depending on the concert. Um, I like the perspective that, that drew me in, that caught my eye, it was impactful. Um, I'd almost, again, you've got such interest in what his hands are doing and the drum set that I'm distracted by the bright of his shirt on his shoulders. Um, if you could tone that down a little bit more because I see the subject of this is the hands and the drums and the circles and the straights. Um, and, uh, but generally, I love the perspective of this image. Drums by Eric Wethington, 20 points. Looks like an interesting montage here is what I'm going to go with. I'm not sure if it's, uh, I don't think it's uh, laid out like this in reality. I think they took the various elements and put it together. And uh, it's interesting talking about neon and the different colors. And, uh, you yeah, know, I enjoy the faces. And it's just kind of a, one of those, you know, fun, frivolous type of images. And those are great to do. Nevada Neon by John Paganini, 20 points. I think we all got it. We <laughs> took a look at this initially and say, what kind of bait is he using here to... Mm -hmm. to, 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 to <laughs> so anyway, uh, there's, there's a, a bit of humor to this, um, which, which I think always uh, adds to an image. The uh, kind of interaction between the fisherman and the, and the moose and his line still dangling in the water somewhere, I think... Um, Makes us, it really tells a story, and I think that's the main point of this. I think that really works out well. Um, looks like it's uh, tonalities, sharpness, a little bit of reflection there, uh, works out well, and uh, I think this just, I think it just tells a great story. Moose Fishing by Dave Korosek, 22 points. <laughs> We've all seen this guy from the front. It was interesting seeing him from the back uh, with his cheeks stuffed with nuts. And, and I kind of would like, the, the, I mean, the detail's beautiful in the fur and such, and we know these guys are very skittish. I would like to see if there was an opportunity to get his face and his eyes, because that, that could be comical as well. Autumn Abundance by Joe Smith, 19 points. Definitely uh, capturing a moment here when the, he's sitting there, the bull's trying to, you know, buck him off in there. You know, lighting's real good, and obviously high-speed capture. You've got him on there. It's not blurred. Um, thing is, though, I, I, I find the distraction of the guy in the green shirt. Obviously, he's got to be there. He's probably operating the doors and so forth. But either a different angle or somehow isolate the guy in the bull. I think would make this a, a lot stronger image. Don't Step on My Hat by Dennis Wirt, 21 points. Well, this is a wonderful portrait. Um, lighting is uh, very nice. The detail and the sometimes 
I almost consider this like, like a bridal dress, can be very difficult because you can really wash out the whites very easily with lighting, and I think that was handled very well. The um, story it tells as far as to, you know, looking off into the distance and seeing uh, the little rays of light on the, on the ground, I think, work out well. Again, it's a very nice capture with a lot of detail, uh, tells a n nice story. I guess I, the only thing I was looking for is a, a little brace, you know, getting very picky, but looking for a little brace uh, to hold up the table on the other side. Uh, sometimes it just um, maybe needs another leg to stand on, I don't know. But that's just for being very, very uh, selective in my criticism, but every, everything else in the picture, the detail, the lighting, the pose, the uh, difficulty with capturing detail in that white dress was handled very nicely. Looking Toward Freedom by Jackie Sieski, 24 points, second place. I love the patterns here in this architectural detail. Um, I would have um, liked to have seen a little more contrast. <laughs> it seems a touch flat, it. but I, I yeah. just love the abstract quality of this this image. And again, there's this is a, a scene, a location that I would just, I could spend a couple hours just playing with verticals and, and squares and, and just zooming in on those details and such, but a nice abstract image. Patterns in Black and White by Paul Gilia, 21 points. Good, interesting shot of the uh, red panda. You got all the details in there, all the detail in the fur and so forth. Uh, I like the placement too. He's got a little bit of uh, foreground with those logs there, so it gives a little separation, a little bit of depth to the image. Although I do find it a little bit on the washed outside, I think it can be darkened down a bit. Um, a lot of highlights in the background, so I mean that's uh, going to be a distraction, but I think it could use a little more detail as far as more color depth or darkness around the face and so forth. Winter Wonderland by Eric Botsky, 22 points. This photo certainly brings me back to summertime and a nice feel to Mardi Gras and local fairs and so forth. Um, you know, if this is the, f uh, this is a good attempt at long shutter speeds and try to create patterns and so forth. I think it's balanced nicely with two kind of starlit uh, uh, lights on each side of it. I think that creates a nice balance to it. The, um, the geometrics work out nicely, very colorful, saturated, uh, color saturation and so forth. I might have just maybe just brought the top down just a little bit to a crop it just in a little bit tighter. Welcome to the Grand Pavilion by Fran Marino, 20 points. I like seeing the, the abstracts and, you know, pop up every once in a while. This is a very lovely blend of, of images, I mean, color. And um, I, I just, it's almost like I was trying to figure out what it was and a little bit more than just, <laughs> It's accepting it's an abstract image. I don't know if that makes sense. But a lot of beautiful coloration in this, and everything was tack sharp. And it looks like ice or maybe a creative filter um, playing with some different textured filters. And uh, But overall, a lovely mood to this image and nicely done. Medina Ice Festival by Dave Saborik, 22 points. Great captured image of this uh, heron. Um, great, you're able to build the nest up. Lighting's real good. You've got uh, you know good lighting underneath the uh, body itself. You pick up the eye. Wings spread very nicely in the diagonal. That's that's nice. Uh, personally, I think it's a little bit uh, heavy on the right side. There really isn't a whole lot there. Um, I don't know if you're trying to go for the. Uh, a rectangular type of format, but this may work also just as well, if not more powerful, as a square with the uh, wings going from you know, one, one, one diagonal to the other. 
Perfect Form by Katherine Kengott, 23 points, third place. Certainly the impact of this with this deep saturation of the feathers and the color in there uh, placed against the solid black background works out well. There's a nice foundation to this picture of the uh, wood coming in and so forth. I think the thing that uh, really attracted me to this was just the, the placement and the curves and the of the, the movement within the body and so forth, the way the head comes back into the body um, works out well. Um, the Again, the, the coloration of the feathers, very nice. You, you know, there's some, there's some areas that kind of peek through in the, in the uh, between the bottom of the head and the foundation. I don't know whether that would be more effective, maybe possibly a solid black to tone those down a little bit. As, as the solid black is above the, uh, the bird. But well done. Uh, nice placement, nice movement, and lighting is very nice in this also. Spoonbill Grooming by Rick Mills, 25 points, first place. This is a sweet scene I often see in, behind my condo because I have a park next to me. Um, I I I kind of just crop in from the left. I see the you know it's a moment. Is he gonna chomp on that leaf with the snow? Is he thirsty? Um, but I'm thinking just since he's kind of bullseyed in the center, cropping in from the left just a tad would give him a little more space to move forward to the le to the right. But the exposure is nice, and that you didn't get a snowflake right inside his eyeball is great. Mm -hmm. Because um, you, you can't control the snow. But a lovely image, nice mood. Deer Walking Through the Snow by Tyler Kleiman, 21 points. Got some nice colors and a nice feel in place here. Uh, it, it really gives you a sen sense of scale of how large the uh, mountains are. The, uh, you know, you've got the, the houses there, and then there's a ship there, and then obviously the, the, the towering peaks above it. Um, you could probably get to say that I would almost try and crop out the white portion of it and, and you still would have the, uh, the, the, the texture of, of the mountains and hillside but without the distraction of the, uh, the white blank up on top. Norwegian Landscape by Eric Wethington, 21 points. Certainly gives a nice feel for the tall ships. I think I think Lori was even asking if they're coming back <laughs> when she saw this. So uh, it's a nice remembrance, uh, and the, the balance of the you know the, there's a nice balance in this shot, obviously between the two smaller ships and the larger ships in the center. Uh, waves crashing. Um, it tells a wonderful story. Uh, I think even the the printing paper, uh, I think being printed on a matte surface, I think this was, really uh, adds to the uh, timelessness of this shot also. Um, very muted clouds in the background. So all in all, uh, well done and certainly works well as a vertical. Cleveland Waves with Cleveland Tall Ships by Jackie Sieski, 24 points, second place. lovely photo of this orchid. I believe it's a beautiful orchid from maybe CBG, but um, I think the lighting is very good on it. It it reflects the color, the subtle beauty color of this, this blossom, and I think it's well done. I, I like the angle. It's not bullseye, which is kind of easy to do with photography like this is to bullseye the subject, but I think it's nicely set in the frame. Glowing Orchid by Eric Botsky, 20 points. Great image of this, uh, of this creature. Lighting on it's very nice. Uh, 
the fact he picks up the water while it's walking. I mean, you could say, yeah, it's a little bit dead center. If you wanted to, you can crop off a little bit of the right to do, you know, if that bothers you. In this case, it doesn't bother me. I think it, it fills the frame nicely. Um, background, foreground, it all works very nicely. Uh, if anything, the animal itself, his body, I almost darken it down a bit. So I think that the, uh, the actual body back behind the head is a little bit uh, bright. Could stand some darkening, in my opinion. Elk Crossing by Dave Korosek, 22 points. I think we were trying to decide whether that was a ballet dancer in the center or not, but uh, it, uh, it is a nice macro shot. And, you know, the, I guess the creative use of the bordering, I guess, uh, kind of draws things in a bit. Um, the sharp the sharpness when you work with something this close can al can always be a little bit of a, an issue so we have to pick your point of focus um, on something like this but the coloration the deep purple and so forth and it almost it looks like it's possibly backlit a, a bit which uh, well, helps with the separation so um, interesting image the star of the ballet by Fran Marino 21 points got to get over to this bridge scene this this year sometime in the fall I've seen many images from this uh, spot and I kind I kind of see the bridge in there and this is a, a scene where I would say well what is is the subject the fall leaves then zoom in on the fall leaves and if it's of the bridge then make sure the bridge is a little more visible but the exposure looks good, and this it's a very calm scene for me. Berea Falls by Jen Cochran, Cockrell, sorry, excuse me, uh, 19 points. Well, the eye definitely has it here. It's uh, very, very, uh, very distinct. Uh, the colors and the, the plumage are very good, and it, it's fortunate that the bill itself really did not get blended into the background. There's enough highlights in the beak there. Mm -hmm. It separates it out a little bit. Um, I'd almost like to see this as just a horizontal just of the head itself. Um, you know, the neck is wonderful and all that, but it incorporates in so much darkness and, and darkness in the image is just kind of lost there. So it's just uh, another thing to try. I See You by Rick Mills, 23 points, third place. The, I think the facial expression and the peering eyes of this make this shot for me. Uh, and the way that the head's turned back into the frame obviously is a very positive portion of this also. I have a little bit of a border on the bottom which keeps us in. Maybe, you know, there's a little bit of detail in there. Maybe um, that, that could be darkened down a bit. I'm not quite sure. Uh, the, the lighting, though, really uh, adds nice detail to the fur. And um, again, I think the thing that the, the, the thing that makes this shot is the expression and the peering eyes, the pointed ears, and so forth. It's like something's going on here, and you kind of wonder what it is. Looking from fall by Eric Botsky, twenty-four points, second place. beautiful image here um, it's the the timing of the fabric to encircle the dancer it's just spot on and I love that it's um, kind of on the soft side as far as contrast if you if, if you punch it up anymore it might become more more graphic and harsh than soft and um, in texture all around in this image. You know there's a lot of texture in those window grates and the, and the drapery and the floor, but um, I really like, like the softness of everything overall in this image and the, and the motion as well. Freeform by Jackie Sieski, 22 points. And that concludes the competition.
We thank you very, very much to all of our judges, without whom we couldn't have had this. So thank you very much, judges. And thank you very much for all of you that entered uh, as well. We appreciate it. So uh, good evening. <laughs>